phone I'm interested in. N of t is exponent minus h bar omega over kt. So high temperature looks like this, low temperature looks like this. That's just to calculate the energy it gets fairly, fairly easily. Um, it's the total vibrational energy. We get the total vibrational energy I have to sum over all frequencies, sum over all the phonons. So I sum over all the frequencies of all the phonons, n plus one half omega h bar omega. In the high temperature limit, h bar omega much, much less than kt. This n of t is just kt over h bar omega, and this, much greater, this number is much greater than one half. So if I just plug in, the answer turns out to be e is to three n kt, where n is the number of atoms, and three n is the total number of terms in the summation. That's the number of modes. So the high temperature limit, I can solve the problem in quantum mechanics. It doesn't matter what the dispersion relation is. As long as kt is much greater than the biggest frequency I've got, then e is three n kt, cd is three n k. This is the long credit limit. And this holds, notice, when, a, when kt is much greater than the biggest value of h bar omega i have, much greater than the biggest frequency I've got. But what happens at low temperature? At low temperature, things get kind of messy. But notice something about the dispersion relation, what's happening here. First of all, omega goes all the way to zero. So there really is no such thing as a temperature so low that all of the phonons are in the low temperature limit. Some of them have h bar, no matter what t is, as long as it's finite, some of these phonons have h bar omega much, much less than kt. So some of these phonons are in the high temperature limit, and they are excited, no matter how low the temperature is. If, however, the temperature is low, only some of these phonons are excited. The ones up here in the high temperature limit, and they have very, very low excitation numbers. So you see what's happening as I come up in temperature. As I come up in temperature, raise the critical value of h bar omega like this, the energy at which things are excited, more and more of these phonons are excited because more and more of them are down, down at low enough energies that they can be fully excited. So you start out with an absolute zero, no phonons excited. As the temperature comes up, you're exciting more and more phonons. And one simple way to visualize this is let omega be the, uh, be the upper bound of frequencies that are in the high temperature limit. Just imagine you could draw a line here with the omega appropriate to the temperature you're talking about. All of the phonons below that are in the high temperature limit, so they're fully excited. All the ones above that are in the high temperature limit, the first approximation, they aren't excited at all. So as we move that, that line up, more and more modes come into play until finally our low temperature limit is up here somewhere, our, our limit is up here somewhere, and every single mode in the whole thing is excited, and then we're at the high temperature limit. And that is what the, the device temperature does for us. The device temperature is a measure, a good measure, of the temperature at which essentially all of the vibrational modes are in the high temperature limit. When we're below the device temperature, we are building up the specific heat with temperature because more and more modes are being excited. When we're above the device temperature, all the modes are excited like is very simple. CD is given by the simple high temperature formula. And that's basically what's happening. OK, how do we get the low temperature variation? Well, I'll do the full device model for you in the notes. It's not that complicated. It's, uh, you're certainly capable of working your way through it. But let me show you an even simpler way to do it. What the device did in the device model was he said, look, I don't know the exact uh, shape of this dispersion curve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume, because I know about sound waves, that the dispersion curve just goes straight up along the sound speed like this. And then I'll just calculate the number of modes and I'll balance them so the number of modes come out right. And what that gives you is a dispersion curve that looks like this. Starts out omega equals zero, ends up at omega equals omega divide. Uh, the total number of modes in here is fixed to be 3n, where 3n is the total number of atoms. Now, the simple little model I'm going to give you, we're going to assume the following. If um, 2kt, if the temperature is such, or if the frequency we're interested in is such that h bar omega is less than 2kt, then we're pretty certain to be in the high temperature behavior. So we're going to assume that all the modes that satisfy this condition are fully activated. N of t is kt over h bar omega. When h bar omega is greater than 2kt, then we're in the high temperature limit, we're going to assume that none of those modes are activated. So we have a cutoff right here. Here's omega t, such that um, omega t is equal to 2kt over h bar, or t if you want, but that's just the value for omega t. Everything below that is in the high temperature limit. Everything above that is not activated at all. Not a bad approximation to the true situation, though a long way from accurate. And if you do that, you just calculate the vibrational energy. That means you sum over all of the frequencies that have frequencies less than this omega t, recognize that you're in three dimensions. You wind up with um, a vibrational energy, which is 3 nkt. Since you're in three dimensions, the fraction of modes that's going to be activated is omega t over the divide frequency omega d cubed. This is less than one, so this is a, a fraction that is, that, that is activated. If this relation holds in all three directions. So I get delta t over omega d cubed. Turning that, turning that around by just using the definition of, 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 of omega t and omega d, I get vibrational energy of 3 nkt, 2t over theta divide cubed, with a specific e, 12 nk, 2t over theta divide cubed. And this is very, very close to the value that comes out of the divide model, and it's very, very close to the actual value that appears in the specific e. So what do we wind up with? The vibrational um, contribution of the specific e is such that at high temperature, t above theta divide, this thing here, the specific e is just 3 nk. At low temperature, we take off from t equals 0, with cd proportional to 2t over theta d cubed. As we come up, we get into a region in which you need, we need the divide interpolation formula, which is in the notes. And this will actually change from material to complete material, what's called the elliptical modes or something of that sort. In this region, there's going to be some difference from one solid to another. But it's not going to be all that big. And then as we get close to the divide temperature, the curve's got to look like this, because we've got to bend over an asymptote to, to the high temperature behavior. So that is why all of the solids in the world have essentially the same specific heat dependence on temperature if you use the dimensionless temperature, t over theta divide. And um, that's all you need to calculate the thermodynamics of a simple solid, getting, of course, the zero point energy from the energy of the So there we go. Let me just say a little bit about the electronic specific heat while we don't care about it. Electrons are fermions. Remember, we have all these electron states and the energy bands that the electron can fill. And the electrons at zero temperature will start filling the lowest energy states and working their way up. The electrons are fermions, which means I can have one and only one electron in each state. That means at zero temperature, if the Fermi level is right here, at zero temperature, all of these states will be filled, all of these states will be empty. The probability that an electron will be in a state of energy E is given by the Dubai, I'm sorry, by the uh, Fermi Dirac statistic that is given right here. And if you just plug in, you can easily say when E is well below the Fermi energy or T is zero, T of E is equal to one. When E is well above the Fermi energy, uh, I get e to the minus exponent delta E over kT, energy difference in the Fermi energy, precisely at the Fermi energy, the probability of occupation is one half. We use that indirectly early on. And said if you want to find the Fermi level, that is the state that has half probability being full, half probability being empty. So when a metal is right at the top of the filled set of states, and a semiconductor is right in the middle of the, um, of the band gap between the conduction and the various things. Well, all I really need to show you here, because all I really want you to remember from this, is that the electronic uh, contribution of the specific heat is very small. If I look at 
how many states. The only way I'm going to get an increase in energy due to temperature from the electrons is if electrons move from states that are below the Fermi level to states that are above the Fermi level. First of all, that's going to be absolutely negligible unless I'm talking about a metal. Because if I have a semiconductor insulator, there are no state carriers at Fermi level. It's in the band gap. If I'm talking about a metal, then I can get this. But it's only the states that are within KT of the Fermi level that are going to be affected. And in a typical metal, only a very small fraction of the electrons in the system are sitting here in this shell of what 2KT of the Fermi level. So I start heating up the metal. Yes, some of the electrons are excited, but very, very few of them, because only a few of them can be excited, only the ones right here at the Fermi level. And they're not going to be affected very much. They'll be bumped up by an average energy of KT. If I do the following, I can get a simple model very simply. Let's assume the electrons that have energies within KT of the Fermi level are excited, and that each of these electrons are excited by an amount KT. Let G of the F be the density of states in your EF, that is, the number of energy states that are right there at the Fermi level. Then the, um, uh, the thermal energy of the electrons is one half total number of atoms, the fraction of the states that are right at the Fermi level times KT squared. And interestingly, a very complicated quantum mechanical derivation gives exactly the same number. Uh, CB, I differentiate, turns out to be, it's going to be small because G of the F is not big. Only a few of the electrons are actually right at the Fermi level. It's going to be linear heat. Um, you can actually observe this. This tells you that at normal temperatures, you could care less about the electronic contribution of the specific heat. It's just not there. It's negligible. But if you go to very, very low temperature, remember the vibrational specific heat goes to zero at KT. The electronic specific heat goes to zero at T. So there will always be a temperature that is so low that the electronic specific heat becomes dominant. And you can see that in certain materials. It can be found. It's kind of an interesting story. I'll, I'll tell you later on that the, uh, the accidental discovery of superconductivity came about because a fellow was inventing good refrigerators. And the way he was going to show that his refrigerators were so good was that he could get metals to such low temperatures that he could see this. Well, he did in some metals, and some others, all of a sudden, all the resistance went away. And that's how uh, superconductivity was discovered. We'll get to that later in the course. Okay, that finishes what we need to say about the specific heat. And remember that when we're talking about a simple solid, one component solid, simple crystal structure, specific heat is all you need to calculate its thermodynamics. Um, and I just, I just uh, repeated that essentially in this slide. Okay, what are we going to do for our first application? Now, we have the Helmholtz free energy and the Gibbs free energy. The minimum free energy, if we are controlling the temperature, pressure, volume, and the chemical composition, is what determines the equilibrium of the system. So let me move to, do I have time? Yeah. Let me move to our first application of that. Equilibrium phases in a one component system. You know that every material has at least three phases. It can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Um, a solid can exist very often in a number of phases, which are different crystal structures. And in fact, there are an awful lot of elemental solids that have more than one crystal structure. Iron, for example, face in our cubic at high temperature, body center cubic at low temperature. Cobalt, oxide at high temperature, face in our cubic at low temperature, many, many others. Sodium, a lot of, a lot of uh, solids have more than one crystal structure. But now let's suppose that we're interested in knowing when and why the phase of a material will change. So here I just have a simple plot. Here I've plotted. I imagine a material that has two phases. I call them alpha and beta. Could be liquid solid, could be liquid vapor, could be two crystalline solid phases. And uh, suppose now I find some way to compute or measure the free energy of these phases, and I plot that as a function of temperature. I can say a couple of things about this very quickly. Well, let's do F e minus T A. Um, since the, um, uh, what you can easily show that the partial of F with respect to T is the entropy that's positive minus F, so these curves will always come down like this as you come out in temperature. Uh, at low temperature, when we're at absolute zero, the phase that has the lowest energy will also have the lowest free energy because F is equal to zero. So when the temperature is zero, the phase that is preferred is the phase with the lowest energy, in this case, vapor. As we go up in temperature, however, the slope down of this curve is proportional to the entropy. And if the alpha phase has a higher entropy, then as we move up in temperature, these curves may cross. As soon as they do cross, the alpha becomes the stable phase. And our little model here predicts that there will be a structural phase transformation at that point right there. Below T alpha beta, there will be beta phase preferred. Above T alpha beta will be alpha phase preferred. And that simple little relation tells you why there are phase transformations. The solid has lower entropy than the liquid, which is lower entropy than the gas. If you take a solid, you start heating it up. In the usual case, it will melt, then the liquid will boil. And here's the going from solid to liquid. We'll get another gamma out here when you go to liquid to vapor. And what happens is these free energy curves cross at that point. And we change the identification of the phase with the lowest free energy. So here is our, the world's simplest phase diagram. Phase is what we call a phase diagram. Phase diagram for one component system. Our only variable is the temperature. And this is saying at low temperature we have beta, at higher temperature we have alpha. Um, which phase is um, one simple way to tell what a low temperature and high temperature phase is? Solid liquid vapor is kind of easy, but in solid phases it may not be. One of the things that you, you can always say is that the phase that has the lowest value under the Debye temperature, the phase that you want is more vibrationally active, is going to be the high temperature phase. Now, how do I know that? Suppose I take the free, I calculate the free energy difference between the alpha and beta phases. Well, that's the difference between the energies at zero temperature. We've assumed that alpha is the higher, so this is positive. If I then plug in the free energies of both, I get minus specific heat of alpha minus specific heat of beta times this factor right here. P is the temperature to which I'm integrating, the temperature of interest. T prime is the dumbing variable. So this bracket is always greater than, uh, greater than zero. This is a positive bracket. If this bracket here is uh, negative, that is, if Cb alpha is greater than Cb beta, then delta F is going to decrease as the temperature goes up, and I'm likely to get a phase transformation. If Cb alpha is less than Cb beta, this term is positive, the free energy will increase as the temperature goes up, and I therefore don't get a phase transformation. So I will get a phase transformation if Cb, I, well, I, I will eventually get some temperature, perhaps the, the thing will vaporize long before then, but some temperature, I will get a phase transformation if Cb alpha is greater than Cb beta. Now let's suppose that alpha has a lower divide temperature. Remember that the shapes of the specific heat curves are always the same. At high temperature up here, the specific heats are the same. But if the divide temperature of alpha is lower than the divide temperature of beta, there is always a broad range of temperatures over which alpha has a higher specific heat than beta does. Coming back here, that means there is a broad range of temperatures over which this integral will be contributing a negative factor to delta F alpha beta. And that's why, this low even if the phase transformation happens up here somewhere, this low temperature difference is what ultimately drives the transformation from alpha to beta in one component system. 
So that's how the specific heat determines the free energy. That's how the free energy determines the preferred phase. And um, as we see, uh, other things will happen. Well, I think I'll stop there for today. That's enough. And on um, Wednesday, we'll talk about what happens if you have a solution, a multi-component solid, in which case configure things called configurational entropy becomes a big contributor to the solution. So you see on this. Okay, we'll see you on Wednesday. And the math is not gets easier for a long time now. <laughs>